Good morning, and welcome to this very special Grand Rounds. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce one of our chief residents, Emily Jokum, who is going to be presenting her first Grand Rounds. Dr. Jokum is a graduate of the University of Denver, where she was Phi Beta Kappa and received a number of awards. She then went on to the University of Colorado School of uh, Medicine, and then we were fortunate in 2013 to recruit her to our residency and she's uh, progressed on through uh, residency and chief residency. Uh, she's already published uh, four publications, the last two with some of our nephrology colleagues. Um, and she's given a number of presentations, including two at the Wisconsin Dells, the ACP, as well as uh, in 2014 in Las Vegas, the National Kidney Foundation, in 2015 in, in Dallas, the National Kidney Foundation Spring Clinical uh, meeting, and also in 2015, the American Society of Nephrology Kidney Week in San Diego. She's been an active educator in addition to her role uh, as a chief resident giving morning reports. She's been a lecturer for the intern prep course for fourth year medical students. She's uh, participated in the uh, committee for the TEACH pathway in our own residency, and she's been a small group leader for PDS. Uh, she's been a very good citizen within the university community and beyond. She co-founded uh, with um, uh, Vidya the, um, the Internal Medicine Wellness Committee for the residents, and she's been active on the inpatient uh, ward F65 steering committee, as well as the residency curriculum committee. She's been active in the community as well, uh, being uh, active with the Dane County Friends of Ferrells, that's cats, I'm told, um, as well as the medic clinic. And she, as I mentioned, she received a number of awards along the way. Uh, in her spare time, uh, she is a, an avid musician, having learned the violin at the age of six and the viola at 12. I'm told you can actually uh, download the David James Band's um, rendition of Time Capsule in Tokyo where Dr. Jokum is a featured violist, and she is still playing with the uh, Middleton Community Orchestra and performing four concerts a year in Middleton. It's been a pleasure for me to work with Emily throughout this year, uh, as well as all the chief residents, and I know she's really been looking forward to the opportunity to give Rand Rounds today, so I won't delay it any further. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jokum as she presents Grand Rounds entitled Rethinking Kidney Donation, Time to Change the Status Quo. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Page, and thank you everybody for being here today. So I want to start off by telling you a story. Dave Adox was diagnosed with ALS at the age of 42. Within six months, he was almost completely paralyzed, and within two years, he was ventilator dependent. Prior to his diagnosis, he knew that he wanted to be a kidney donor. And after his diagnosis, in order to realistically do this, he knew that he would need to be admitted to the hospital to, to come off of his ventilator and then be able to donate his organs. When the time was right, everything was in place for him to do this. But unfortunately, at the last minute, lawyers um, at his local hospital declined. They said the admit, admitting him to the hospital for the express purpose of ending his life and donating organs sounded too much like assisted suicide. He was left with no other option to donate his organs, something he firmly wanted to do. Fortunately, Dave and his husband Danny were able to find an organ, or an organ procurement um, center called Live On New York, and they were able to actually coordinate um, an admission to Mount Sinai Hospital. There, when he was ready, they disconnected his ventilator. And after he died, he was able to donate his kidneys and his liver and save the lives of three people. When I heard this story, it really got me thinking a lot about the ethics relating to organ transplant. I have worked in our kidney clinic here, working with kidney donors and kidney recipients. And I've also met dialysis patients who have been waiting years for kidney transplants but I had never really stopped to think much about the issues surrounding this and how we might actually be going about improving this for our patients. If not for that innovative program of Live On New York, Dave Adox would not have been able to donate his organs and in the process save the lives of others. 
So today I'm first going to review current data for patients with end-stage renal disease, focusing on um, outcomes in dialysis versus transplant. I'm then going to turn to examine our current kidney wait list and why it's so important that we're talking about these issues. I'll then discuss three ideas for potential changes in organ procurement policy, and these are opt-out legislation, imminent death donation, and payment of living kidney donors. I'll then wrap up by proposing an overall plan that I think we could realistically implement in the United States. So to start off, let's look at some outcomes for patients with end-stage renal disease. As many of you might be aware, the number of patients with ESRD has been steadily increasing over time. In 1996, there was about 300,000 patients with end-stage renal disease, and this has more than doubled to, to over 678,000 as of 2014. So how do these patients with ESRD fare? Well, we know that in general, patients on dialysis do not do well. The five-year adjusted survival for a patient on hemodialysis is 41%. That means that 60% of patients who are on dialysis today will be dead within five years. The five-year survival for peritoneal dialysis is slightly better at about 51% because this is an overall healthier population. If we then compare this to the survival of patients with stage 3C, stage 3C colon cancer, this is 53%. Overall, for ovarian cancer, is 45%, and heart failure is 35%. Now if we look at survival rates for patients who have received a transplant, with a living donor kidney, you have 85% or 75% with a de deceased donor kidney. Of course, we know that overall, uh, patients with end-stage renal disease who are actually listed for a kidney transplant are healthier than the, just the general dialysis population. So Wolf and his colleagues actually investigated the true survival advantage of transplant by comparing patients who had received a transplant to those who remained on the waiting list. They found that 18 months after receiving a cadaveric kidney do, uh, transplant, the relative risk of death was 0.32, and this amounted to about 10 years of life gained by receiving a transplant as opposed to remaining on the waiting list. So clearly, a uh, transplant gives our patients a huge survival advantage. We also know that kidney transplant matters in terms of quality of life for our patients. Dialysis pa patients consistently have higher anxiety and depression than patients who receive a transplant. Patients on hemodialysis have a depression rate of 25%. That's four times that of the general population. Compared with dialysis, patients with transplant also have better physical function, social engagement, involvement in recreational activities, and ability to work. So kidney transplant is both important to survival as well as quality of life for our patients. So why can't everybody just get a kidney transplant? Let's go ahead and focus on our current organ wait list. As of May 6, 2017, there were 97,722 people waiting for a kidney transplant and 1,700 waiting for a combined kidney pancreas. If we then compare this to the number of transplants we do every year in the United States, in 2016, we did about 19,000 kidney transplants. About 13,000 of these are from deceased donors and about 5,500 from living donors. And while you see that the number of deceased, donation, um, deceased donors has been increasing over time, the number of living donors has actually um, been declining ever since 2004. So the mismatch between the number of kidneys available and the number of people who actually need them means that our supply of organs is falling hopelessly short. This figure demonstrates the increase in the percentage of patients on dialysis who are actually listed for a kidney transplant, but you can see that the transplant rate is, is declining. So this is leading to diverging curves. For patients on the wait list, this also means that they are going to wait years to receive a kidney transplant. For patients who were listed in 2012, three years later in 2015, 45% of them were still waiting for a kidney transplant. And the median waiting time for a kidney is over four years. So to recap, there are about 98,000 patients currently waiting for a kidney transplant, yet only about 19,000 kidney transplants done last year. 
Most patients wait over four years for a kidney transplant. And this is important because longer dialysis time prior to transplant leads to worse post-transplant outcomes for our patients. On average, 22 people die every day waiting for an organ transplant. This amounts to thousands of people dying every year, the majority of them waiting for a kidney. So now that I've discussed the, the issue here, I want to turn to discuss three ideas for potential changes to improve this process. My goal by investigating these three topics was to explore first, are they efficacious? What do we know about their ability to actually improve organ donation? I then wanted to consider some of the ethical implications of these ideas and discuss whether or not it could be or should be implemented in the United States. So let's start out with the first idea, which is transitioning to an opt-out system for deceased organ donation. You're probably somewhat familiar with an opt-in system for organ donation. This is what the United States currently does. So in this type of system, a person has to give explicit consent in order for their organs to be used after death. They can do this by registering as an organ donor or by having their family consent to organ donation after they die based on their knowledge of their loved one's wishes. On the other hand, in an opt-out system, everybody is presumed to be an organ donor unless they have registered their opposition to do so. In practice, there are two different ways this is employed in different countries, and a system may be described as a hard or soft opt-out system. So in a hard opt-out system, organs are procured regardless of the family's preferences unless that person has registered as a non-donor. On the other hand, in a soft opt-out system, the family's views actually are taken into account and they can refuse to donate organs. So what are the potential appeals of an opt-out system? Well, people say that there are potentially a large number of organs available to us if we could just presume consent of these individuals. And they point to the fact that only a small percentage of people actually register to be organ donors in opt-in countries. Although from population studies, we actually know that the support for organ donation is much higher. So by presuming consent, we could potentially bridge that gap between people's intentions and their actions. Some people feel that having the default to donate your organs after death may be viewed as the public, by the public as a recommendation to do this. And finally, maybe many people use the example of Spain as a successful opt-out system as Spain does have um, opt-out legislation from 1979 and has the highest deceased donor rate in the world. Before I go further, I actually want to clarify what goes on in Spain as it's important to the rest of this section. So as I mentioned, Spain did pass opt-out legislation in 1979. However, it was initially unclear how they were going to enact this. And so in 1980, they decided that the best way to establish the potential donor's wishes was actually by asking their family. This is, in fact, an opt-in system. By 1989, Spain had not seen any improvement in their donation rate, which was the primary goal of this 1979 legislation. And so they actually introduced an entirely new, organized national transplant system, and since then have seen great improvements in their donation rates. However, Spain continues to be called an opt-out system in many studies and, and um, throughout uh, the literature. In 2010, Spain's national transplant director actually um, clarified this, saying that opt-out legislation in Spain is dormant. They make no effort to bring anyone's attention to this, and they don't have an opt-out registry. So Spain is, in fact, in policy, an opt-in country, and they've had great success by doing this. For some other examples of opt-in versus opt-out countries, you can see that besides the United States, other opt-in countries of note are um, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and I've put Spain here um, appropriately. There was actually a lot of opt-out countries, which I found surprising. Perhaps you guys will too. Um, but some notable examples are Austria, Belgium, France, Italy, and Sweden. How do the donation rates in these countries compare? Well, this shows the 2015 worldwide deceased donor rates. And this is expressed in rates per million population in order to standardize across countries. Up here in red, you can see opt-in countries, and in blue, opt-out countries. Spain, as I mentioned, is number one in the world with a deceased donor rate of 54 per million population. 
the United States trails behind at about 38.5. And the other take home I wanted to, to you guys to get from this figure is that there are a number of opt-in countries with high donation rates, but there are also a number of opt-out countries with very low donation rates. So this immediately suggests to me that policy in these countries may not be everything. So does opt-out legislation actually improve donation rates? There was a systematic review that tried to examine this by looking at a variety of studies, comparing opt-in and opt-out countries. They had a lot of variable conclusions. So in some studies, they had up to a 30% improved donation rate in presumed consent countries. One study estimated this was about six donors per million population more than in opt-in countries. However, some studies also showed no effect at all on the donation rates. Unfortunately, though, many of these studies had very poor methodology and did not control for factors that are actually known to influence donation rates, such as stroke mortality, road traffic accident rates, um, healthcare expenditure of the country, um, and also transplant capacity of the country. Many studies also misclassified Spain as an opt-out country or excluded opt-out countries with very low rates of donation, further making this data questionable. So another way of trying to examine this problem is by looking at donation rates in a single country before and after a switch to opt-out legislation. In 1982, Austria adopted an opt-out policy, and they were able to dramatically improve their donation rates. However, during this time, there were also educational campaigns and structural changes that they put into place in order to procure organs. Belgium also switched in 1986 and they were able to more than double their rate in a short period of time. However, they also had a nationwide campaign about the benefits of organ donation and education of healthcare professionals. So in these cases, it's actually very difficult to tell whether or not it's actually the legislation that's led to any improvement, or rather if it's the changes in the organization and education these countries have put into their system. What if we instead looked at opt-in countries that just changed the infrastructure of their program but did not actually change opt-out legislation? So the UK was strongly considering changing to an opt-out system in the mid-2000s. They ultimately decided not to do this but instead restructured their program and led to a lot of public education and public campaigns. They were able to increase their donation rate from what was very poor at 13 to almost 33 in our most recent data. As I mentioned, Spain put into place in 1989 that national new organized transplant system, and they were able to increase their donation rate from 14 per million to 54 per million. Finally, another interesting example I found was that in 1999, Italy actually had decided and, and had um, voted in for opt-out legislation. However, it was not immediately implemented throughout the country. And Tuscany, um, the Tuscany region in Spain actually implemented key portions of the model used in Spain and were able to double their donation rate before that opt-out legislation was even enacted. So we can see that there is also great success with just putting uh, effort, um, education, and um, infrastructure into an existing transplant program. I also came across some cautionary tales. In 1997, Brazil tried to transition to an opt-out system. However, they had to revoke this in less than a year after massive public outcry. People were afraid that their organs were going to be procured before they were even dead, and this led to a lot of mistrust in their transplant system. In France in 1992, they had an unfortunate case where they actually inappropriately procured organs from a road traffic accident victim. This again led to mistrust in their transplant system and a temporary decrease in donation rates. France has actually changed their legislation further in 2017 and have now moved to a hard opt-out system. So if you recall, now family members can't refuse to donate, so that person actually has to register as a non-donor. This was enacted January 1st. As of January 2nd, over 150,000 people had reportedly rushed to the local offices to sign up as non-donors. So this shows us that there's potential for a great deal of harm without really much known benefit. So in summary, I've shown you that opt-out legislation is not essential to have deceased donor, high deceased donor rates. In fact, Spain is the highest in the world and does not have opt-out policies. 
Many opt-out countries, in fact, have lower donation rates than even the United States. And there's really no convincing data to suggest that it's actually legislation that's leading to improvement in donation rates. However, I think there is a lot of concern that mistrust from such a change in legislation could actually lead to a decline in our donation rates. All right, moving on to the second idea I explored, and this is something known as imminent death donation. And many of you have probably not heard about this because this is actually not a current way that you can donate organs, but it's an idea that's been discussed in the United States since about 2012. Imminent death donation is the idea of recovering a living donor organ immediately prior to the planned withdrawal of ventilator support, which is expected to lead to a patient's death. So this has been proposed because many patients who want to donate organs don't fit neatly into the categories we have for them to do this. There are currently three options for organ donation. The first of this is dis donation after circulatory death or donation after cardiac death. And this is probably most familiar to you. In this case, once a patient has not been breathing and not had a pulse for a period of time, usually three to five minutes, they're declared dead and, and then organ procurement can progress. The second option is donation after brain death. And this usually happens after some sort of catastrophic neurologic injury or severe anoxic brain injury. So in this case, um, once, uh, once there's been a protocol for um, determining brain death and once that patient is determined to be brain dead, they are in fact legally dead. And if they want to be a donor, um, they can then proceed with organ procurement. The final option is for living donation, and this is of a single kidney or a partial liver. So living donors are very carefully screened to ensure that harms to them are minimized. This is also the only type of donation that actually re requires first-person consent, which means that the person themselves has to consent to this procedure and it cannot be done by a surrogate. That'll actually be important in a few minutes. Let me tell you several stories to illustrate when imminent death donation might be important. The first person I want to tell you about is Dylan Mueller, and he was a Wisconsin resident. He was 18 years old when he suffered a severe and irreversible brain injury after complications from a wasp sting. He wasn't brain dead, but because of the severe nature of his injury and his inability to recover, his family decided that they wanted to stop life support and allow him to die peacefully. His mother actually uh, approached the, the physician team before he died and asked about the potential of donating one of his kidneys before they stopped life support. But she was told that that was impossible due to our current laws. Dylan was uh, not a healthy living donor, and he was not able to sign the consent himself. As he was also not brain dead, the only option left for, for the family was to try a donation after circulatory death. They went ahead and did this, but unfortunately, he did not die quickly enough for any of his organs to be procured. The mother, her, his mother expressed the family's dismay, saying, We were so disappointed. I wanted something good to come out of this horrible situation. And with regard to that one kidney she had asked to be donated, she said, That would have been at least one guaranteed life saved. Organ donation has actually been shown to be psychologically beneficial for do donors' families, especially in cases of unexpected or traumatic deaths, such as in Dylan's case. If the patient then doesn't die in a timely manner, the family has to additionally deal with the guilt and disappointment of not being able to donate organs. As one transplant physician said of this situation, how can an outcome like this be ethically desirable? The second person I want to tell you about is Wayne Bender, and he was a Madison resident. He was diagnosed with ALS in 2014. After his diagnosis, he wanted something good to come out of it, so he actually applied to be a living kidney donor. After careful consideration and evaluation, he was, uh, he was eventually turned down. The transplant team was concerned about the surgery and the nephrectomy affecting his quality of life and the length of his life. He was not, after all, a healthy living donor. As expected from his ALS, he continued to worsen, and he again approached the transplant team about donating a kidney. At this time, they, co they considered it again and actually undertook a legal analysis of possible risks. The hospital lawyers felt that were Wayne to die within the weeks, months, or year after um, donating his kidney, the physicians in his case could be charged with accelerating or causing his death. 
Well, now, this is not only a problem for those physicians, but also when you have a death of a living donor in a transplant program, that prompts an investigation that usually shuts down the program while the investigation is going on. So this would affect many other people who were potentially going to obtain um, organ donation at that time. So the only plan left to, for Wayne was to attempt donation after circulatory death. This is often difficult for patients with ALS because of the issue about respiratory support. And many of them have decided that they don't want to be intubated or have um, be on a ventilator um, before this happens. However, usually for donation, it becomes necessary in order to make sure that the organs are viable for transplant. And so Wayne actually did decide he would be interested in this if it would allow him to donate organs. So the plan was left as when he felt like he was getting worse, he would try to go to the hospital, likely be intubated, and then if things happened and he did die, hopefully be able to donate his organs after circulatory death. This did not happen for Wayne. He died May 30th, 2016, without being able to donate any of his organs. So this illustrates two categories of patients where imminent death donation could be important. So patients like Dylan, who have devastating irreversible neurologic injuries, but who are not brain dead. And then patients who have progressive and life-limiting diagnosis, who have stopped, decided that they want to stop life-sustaining measures. Well, what is the issue with just waiting for circulatory death in these types of patients? Well, realistically, the timing of a patient's death actually determines whether or not organs can be procured. And this has to do with the ischemia time. So in one-thirds of cases where DCD donation is attempted, organs actually cannot be retrieved due to the prolonged ischemic time. We also know that DCD kidneys are more likely to have poor outcomes after transplant, causing complications in the recipients and also decreased longevity of that organ. And finally, something I actually did not know is that usually um, uh, life-sustaining measures are actually stopped in the OR for these types of patients, and that's so that once the patient is declared dead, organ procurement can occur without further um, accumulation of, of ischemic time. And so this is definitely less than ideal situation for the patient's family. So what are be potential benefits for imminent death donation? Well, obviously, uh, one appeal would be increased availability of organs, as there are estimated hundreds to thousands of organs every year that are not able to be used after um, failed attempts at DCD donation. It would provide better quality of organs by reducing ischemic time and allow the patient's family to fulfill the desire to become an organ donor. This could also help avoid um, withdrawing care or life support in the OR environment. However, there are a lot of concerns with this idea, and one of the main ones is that this idea tends to erode what is known as the dead donor rule. So in the world of transplant, this essentially means that um, an organ donor must be dead before you can start procuring organs, or in other words, you're not actually killing someone by taking out their organs. With a change like this, the concern is that it becomes less clear we're actually going to draw the line, and people are concerned that this would start us down kind of a slippery slope in the world of transplant. There's also a lot of concern that this could cause more public mistrust in our transplant system, um, and among some uh, members of the public, there's already a fear that if you're an organ donor, you will not receive the same tr uh, treatment because we just want to go ahead and get your organs, which is, of course, not true. And it's also unclear how many additional organs this would actually give us. So in regard to whether it would increase the number of donated kidneys, it's really unknown. As I mentioned, there are hundreds of organs every year that do not get used after failed DCD attempts. But if you think about what you get from perhaps an imminent death donation, that would be um, to start with one kidney. Versus in a successful DCD donation, you perhaps get maybe eight organs. So it's actually unclear whether you'd be gaining organs or actually losing them in this situation. So in summary, imminent death donation is the idea of removing an organ just prior to stopping life support. And I think this is an idea that has the potential to help some patients in certain situations become organ donors, but it really needs a lot of further exploration, especially with regard to public opinion, um, before it could realistically be implemented. One of the things that I really noticed throughout learning more about this is we don't even have very good defined pathways for patients at the end of their lives 
who want to donate organs, like Wayne Bender and the story in the beginning, Dave Adox. And so that would be something we could focus on. Okay, so the final topic I wanted to explore more is payment for living kidney donors. And I know this is a very fiercely um, debated topic in the world of transplant with very strong opinions actually on both sides. So for some background, why don't we currently pay donors? In 1984, the National Organ Transplant Act outlawed the sale of human organs. They stated that it should be unlawful for any person to transfer any human organ for valuable consideration. The primary goal of this was to ensure that an organ market could not be established in the United States. And payment for organs is illegal in almost every other country in the world. You may or may not know this, but Iran is actually the only country that has a legal, government-regulated program of payment for living kidney donors. It was set up in 1988 because Iran lacks the infrastructure and organization to support a deceased donor kidney program, so realistically, living donors were their only opportunity to, to perform transplants for their patients. So this admittedly brings up a lot of strong feelings um, on both sides of the coin here. Um, and a lot of varying opinions. So I wanted to actually sort of put aside these feelings and actually explore how this program was set up, how they had possibly dealt with the ethical issues that come with payment for organs, and see especially how donors were treated and how donors felt about this system. So in Iran, um, donors are given a sacrifice gift, which is supposed to be an acknowledgement of their altruism for donating their kidney. This entails a standardized contribution from the government, which is about 1,200 US dollars. They also receive an additional amount from the recipient, which ranges from about $1,000 to $10,000, and this is based on what the recipient can afford. They also receive one year of free health insurance. So for some comparison, the annual salary in Iran is about 470 US dollars. They also set up the system so that donors must be Iranian citizens. And this was done in order to pr try to prevent exploitation of the poorest people in Iran who tend to be refugees. One of the resources I actually found was very insightful in regard to the human aspects of this system was this book called The Kidney Sellers. Uh, Sigrid fry Revere is a journalist who actually traveled to Iran to firsthand ex explore this program in 2007-2008. She traveled to multiple different regions of the country and was able to conduct hundreds of interviews with donors, recipients, physicians, and government employees. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of her conclusions um, throughout this section, but I think the biggest takeaway was that there really are both positive and negative things about this system. And if anybody's interested um, in this topic, I would highly recommend reading this book. It's really interesting and insightful. So, does the system work in Iran? Yes. They have eliminated their wait list for kidney transplants since 1999, and they actually maintain an active list, a waiting list for donors. In 2005, Iran performed 19,000 kidney transplants. Almost all of these were living donors. And in the United States, if you recall, there was only about 5,600 living donor transplants done last year. There's no evidence of international kidney trade, and there have no, been no documented um, organ donation from refugees to Iranian citizens. They've also found that the majority of both donors and recipients are of low socioeconomic status. While this sounds promising, there were a lot of concerns that came up in the, in the book, The Kidney Sellers, as well as um, literature I found. Realistically, most donors do donate their kidney in order to try to improve their financial status. But unfortunately, most people don't actually end up achieving this. In one study, only 5% of patients, 5% uh, of donors, felt that they were able to meet their financial goals, while 66% of them said that they actually experienced negative, negative financial consequences through donation. Additionally, there was a lot of negative psychosocial effects. And this is something that surprised me because this is not something that we see among altruistic donors in other countries. In Iran, 60% of patients experienced post-operative depression, and over 70% had post-operative anxiety. In the, in the book, many patients described experiencing feelings of sadness, 
worthlessness, shame, and regret. 85% of them said, given the chance, they would not do it again. There's also concern about lack of long-term risks among donors. Um, in one study, 80% of donors claimed that they did not know that there were any short or long-term complications of having a nephrectomy. And only 16% were actually aware that end-stage renal disease was a complication of the procedure. It's unclear whether this is due to poor consenting or if, in fact, donors are more ignoring these types of risks because of the financial incentives. Also, despite the fact that this is a legal system, I found that there is still a lot of stigma associated with donating kidneys, which is something that also surprised me. Um, many uh, donors expressed the feeling that, of shame that this was the only way they were able to provide for their family financially. And in fact, uh, many uh, donors did not even tell their family that they had done so because of that shame. So, this goes into the ethical arguments against payment for kidneys. The first is an undue inducement to donate. In other words, offering an incentive that's so great that you would cause um, people to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do, such as donate a kidney. There's concern that payment will crowd out altruistic donors who actually might be dissuaded from donating an organ due to um, the stigma associated with donating for money. There's always concern, of course, about exploiting people of poor um, or vulnerable populations through this process. And finally, through sale of human body parts, we start getting concerned about commodification of the human body and degradation of personal dignity. On the other hand, if we were able to improve the number of kidneys we obtain through payment, this would be a, a number of lives that we would be able to save. Some people also suggest that a, a regulated market would actually decrease or eliminate black market sales, which put donors at highest financial and medical risk. Finally, one interesting argument I came across is that um, everybody else in the donation process is actually receiving something. It's only the donor that is expected to, to be giving something without any expectation of anything in, um, in reward for that. What I actually found through research and from talking to people is that in most countries, do, the donor actually ends up paying out-of-pocket cost, out costs to donate their kidney. And I was very surprised by this. So up to 45% of kidney donors incur some sort of cost during the process of donating their organ to someone else. This is a wide range, but up to $28,000, with about a third of people um, experiencing out-of-pocket expenses of over $3,000, which I think for most people is a very large chunk of money. These uh, costs relate to travel and accommodation, lost wages, and dependent care, so child and elder care. One commonly held myth is that we can't reimburse donors because this would violate that 1984 National Organ Transplant Act. We can't pay our kidney donors. But in fact, reimbursement for lost wages, time, um, and travel expenses is not the same thing as payment for an actual organ. And in fact, fact the National Organ Transplant Act specifically says that valuable consideration does not include expenses of travel, housing, um, or lost wages that are incurred by the donor. So it's actually entirely legal to be uh, reimbursing our donors for the expenses they're accruing. One concern about compensation or even perhaps reimbursement is that um, it will disproportionately affect or perhaps attract people of low socioeconomic status. Unfortunately, however, the system of living donation is actually currently already very unequal and patients of low socioeconomic status are less likely to be able to have a living donor. This relates to financial concerns as well as this population being disproportionately affected by comorbidities that then eliminate them from being a living donor. There have been a few things attempted to try to uh, provide some help for people. One of these is uh, tax deductions, and this is, these are present in 15 states. This is for donation-related expenses. This is only, however, useful to people who actually benefit from itemizing their deductions, which generally are not people of low or even middle class. For people who have actually taken these deductions, it amounts to be about $650. There is only um, one national assistance program for donors who actually can't afford these costs, 
It's called the National Living Donor Assistance Center. This is, of course, not available to everybody, and it's based entirely on means testing. It additionally does not actually reimburse people for their lost wages. So would payment increase kidney donations? I don't think we really know the answer to that. It does work in Iran, but that's a very different situation than we have in the United States. And many people feel that actually a pilot study would be needed to further investigate um, what effect this would have on our donation rates. Finally, what about reimbursement and in, in, uh, increase in kidney donations? Well, there's some thought it might improve the donation rate if people are um, no longer concerned about financial issues or people who are on the fence, perhaps, because of these issues. I would argue, however, it is the right thing to do regardless of that. So in summary, this, the system in Iran is effective, but there are a lot of ethical issues that remain to be explored. And realistically, the U.S. is nowhere near being able or uh, being ready to d directly compensate organ donors. I think instead we should first focus on reimbursement of donor expenses, which is something we currently don't do. Okay, so now that I've discussed these three ideas to improve kidney donation, I wanted to try to put something together of an overall plan to actually um, improve kidney donation rates. So my first step to go along what I just talked about is um, improving our living donor financial support. And I think this needs to be done through a government-supported program so that we're not actually then asking recipients to be paying these costs. Our donors need to be guaranteed to have a job after they return from our transplant, which is something that's not currently afforded to everybody. And additionally, guarantee of medical insurability without issues of um, pre-existing conditions. They also, we also need to ensure that they don't have discrimination when they go to apply for um, life insurance or a disability insurance, which does happen to a proportion of people who have donated. With regard to reimbursement, um, we should guarantee people 30 days of paid leave, which is actually what state and federal employees currently get. Now, whether this would be 100% um, of compensation or if we would perhaps cap it at a certain amount, we'd need to discuss further. Um, and then reimbursement for travel expenses and child and elder care. Finally, um, I think that we also need to think about um, coverage for complications after nephrectomy. So currently, if there's a surgical complication, the recipient's insurance actually pays for that. But if there's any medical complications, say someone develops hypertension five years down the line, there's actually no way that that person can get any coverage for that. So if they don't have their own insurance, they either have to pay out of pocket or they just don't get care for that condition. I did a little bit of a worksheet on financial feasibility just to see if this was in fact something that we could actually do. So if we um, take first the upfront costs for a donor expenses, I estimated this could be a range of perhaps $5,000 to $25,000 for that initial kind of um, lost wages and travel accommodations. Then if we turn to how much it would cost to give these people um, insurance, the annual per capita health care expenditure is about $4,500 per year for healthy adults. However, if we limit this to only nephrectomy-related complications, um, this would perhaps be less, maybe $1,000 a year. And that person would only need coverage for uh, between a maximum of, I guess, 47 years because uh, once they turn 65, um, they're eligible for Medicare. Um, but I used the number 45 to make it a little bit easier. So if we assume about a max of 45 years of coverage needed, the lifetime donor cost to reimburse our donors would be $50,000 to $70,000 per person. Looking at what Medicare currently pays, it costs about $121,000 a year to pay for dialysis versus a transplant, which costs $145,000 upfront for the initial surgery and then about $32,000 a year afterward for transplant maintenance. And Medicare only pays for three years, after which the person is supposed to be able to get their own insurance through employment. So in three years, um, Medicare pays $363,000 for dialysis, versus a transplant is $241,000. So transplant gives Medicare savings of $122,000 in three years. So if we take Medicare savings and then deduct what it would cost to support our living donors, Medicare is still going to, to save uh, fifty-two to $72,000 per person that receives a transplant. So this is a really rough estimate, but I think it shows that it is financially feasible to actually reimburse our living kidney donors. 
This would go uh, very far to actually create a better culture of appreciation for donors um, and ensure that they will be taken care of as if there's any complications as a result of their gift to somebody else. And as I mentioned, it may help to improve living donation rates, but I don't have any data to give you a firm estimate of what that would look like. The second step in my plan would be to work on improving deceased donor rates. And so this would be by adopting key, model, key portions of the Spanish model, which I've been telling you about now for like 45 minutes, and you finally get to know what this is. So um, in Spain, their transplant coordinators are actually also ICU physicians. So they spend part of their time as ICU physicians and part of their time as transplant coordinators. The benefit of this is that they're actually able to employ um, transplant coordinators in very small hospitals across the country where otherwise it's not actually feasible to have a coordinator there because of low donation rates. But donate low donation rates altogether equal a lot of kidneys. These transplant coordinators also do a very good job of identifying potential donors early and approaching their families and talking about organ donation. Finally, Spain has a national training system um, for anybody who is either directly or indirectly involved in organ donation. And I think this could allow the whole team to be better on the same page and able to better support the family's decision to um, donate organs or even um, bring it up with the family or answer questions if they have been trained appropriately. So if the United States were able to increase our donation rate to equal that of Spain, um, so currently Spain is at 54 and the United States is at 38, that would give us an additional 50, uh, 15 per million increase in donors. If we multiply this by our U.S. population, that would give us a, an additional 4,981 kidneys to donate every year. The third step is to work on improving donation process for patients at the end of their life. And so for this example, I picked ALS, as that's a common um, one that comes up. So this would be a pathway for patients in any hospital to be admitted, um, stop life support, and then be able to be a DCD donor. And it could be some sort of joint palliative care ICU protocol for these patients. The ALS Foundation estimates that there are about two deaths from ALS per 100,000 pe uh, people in the United States. So this amounts to about 6,400 deaths from ALS every year. On average, the consent rate for deceased donation is variable, but on average it's about 70%. So I estimated that perhaps in ALS it would be lower due to issues regarding respiratory um, support. So if we assume a 60% donation rate, that leaves us with about 3,800 ALS donors. Um, and in practice, about 20% of uh, these attempts will be unsuccessful. And so a 20% DCD discard rate would then leave us with about 3,000 donors. Each donor has two kidneys, and so we would be getting about 6,100 additional kidneys. So the total number of deceased donor kidneys gained from improving our um, transplant program and in adopting key portions of the Spanish model and then improving donation process for only one illness, ALS, would afford us an additional 11,143 kidneys to transplant every year. And if you recall that in 2016, we performed 13,431 deceased donor transplants. So this is almost a 100% increase. So to summarize for today, I really want you to take away that transplant is the ideal renal replacement therapy for patients with end-stage renal disease. So if you remember nothing else, please refer your patients early for transplant evaluation, as this really matters for them. I've shown you that the wait list we currently have far exceeds the number of available kidneys and that it's really important that we're actually thinking about how to make this better. I've explored three different options, which are actually just three of the many kind of proposed ideas out there to try to improve organ donation rates. And there really is no right or perfectly uh, um, a good way to actually improve donation rates. And we need more discussion, I think, about innovative ways to try to do so. I think that continued modification and improvement 
of our current system is likely to be more successful than actually doing complete shifts and changing to perhaps a different type of policy or legislation. Hopefully, with these improvements, we will be able to prevent thousands of deaths uh, every year for patients who are waiting for organ donation. So I want to thank you guys. Um, oops. And I want to thank a number of people for helping me both with this presentation and listening um, to me practice multiple times. I want to thank my co-residents and my very um, helpful cat, uh, Louie. <laughs> so thank you, and I'll take any questions. That was outstanding. I wonder, was Louis Farrell or is he? No, he's, he's very yeah. tame. Got it. <laughs> so with that, I'll ask you to call on the audience and please repeat the question. with this, of course, is how to get it done. And in Congress, of course, it's very difficult to get anything done, but there's um, some innovative uh, programs in the Medicare, Medicaid program to actually um, try to save Medicare money. And so this would be something to propose for that. So thank you. Other questions? And will you hear about these, these are probably urban legend people going someplace outside the U.S. and waking up without a kidney. Um, <laughs> is, there, is there a black market that you're aware of? Did you look at that at all in terms of, uh, of organ donation? So the question was about, you know, there's these rumors that you go somewhere and wake up without a kidney um, that's been taken, and sort of about whether or not there is a black market for organs. And there is, in fact, I didn't do a ton of research on um, the black market, but there is indeed a black market for organ sales still. Um, and a lot of that entails sort of medical tourism, so people actually will try, the, someone who needs a, a, an organ will actually go to a different country and get that surgery and find a donor, or some sort of donor will come forward after like a retreat of some sort and come back to the United States. So those were mostly the situations that I found, but I didn't do a whole lot of looking into that. Because um, obviously it's not something that we want to encourage, so <laughs> definitely not a good protocol. So, Dr. Jamali. really interesting. So the question was about, you know, with social media, what is sort of the utility of that for um, potential recipients or even potential donors? Um, and actually, um, that's very interesting. And one of the um, living donor advocates, Rebecca Hayes, is actually really interested in that as well. I think one of the main benefits of having these stories and having people, you know, saying, I need a kidney on Facebook or some sort of social media is that it's bringing a lot of attention and awareness to the issue. Um, and so you'll see these stories about, you know, someone who, like, saved the life of this little girl by giving them part of their liver. And, I mean, that just gives people this feeling of, like, I can actually do this and people do this and make a difference. And so I think just getting those stories out there is the, the biggest thing to encourage people to donate. Um, and also, you know, can help recipients find someone that's not in their social circle or someone they don't know. And so I definitely think it's uh, interesting, and I think it's potentially a really good thing for a lot of people. So.
actually totally agree. So the comment was about um, that one of the reasons that we've seen a lag in our organ donation is because our living organ donation is because we really don't have a lot of um, information about long-term outcomes, especially for minorities and, and for women. And so using perhaps some international data would help us to better counsel and better alleviate fears of potential donors. So that's a really good idea. Dr. Zikowski. So I'm honestly not aware of any particular data. I know that I, when I spoke to our living donor advocate, they actually do like a comprehensive like financial risk um, counseling with every potential living donor to sort of talk about like, you know, are you going to get wages paid for through your job? Like what are your costs? You know, like do you need travel costs? Um, and sort of estimate what it will be costing them. And they actually do have suggestions such as like, um, you know, asking people you know or doing fundraisers or things like that to sort of get those funds to cover your costs. Um, but I definitely think it is a deterrent, although I don't have any, any data. But definitely, you know, that's a lot of money for a lot of people to undergo when they're also, like, giving up their kidney. So, um, yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm afraid. <laughs> One quick question, quick answer, okay. please. So I know that generally about 10% of living donors have difficulty getting life insurance after they've had a nephrectomy. And so a lot of times part of that counseling, that pre-surgery counseling involves go get life insurance now. But if for some reason they haven't done it, then, then there is some issue getting that because they do have, you know, they have one kidney, so they're theoretically at higher risk. Um, yeah. So with that, we have to close. I want to congratulate Dr. Jokum for an outstanding grand round. Thank you.